All right. Hi, everyone. Um, as my bio just mentioned, uh, many of you guys may know me from Apollo. Um, now, from this day forward, or from a, a month or two ago forward, uh, I will be affiliated with Kronos. Um, the switch here is not one of particular substance. Uh, we had to change an organization. I wanted to do a lot more investments and do a lot bigger investments, so we went from Apollo to his grandfather um, when we changed the name. <clears throat> so I presume that this is, yeah, how I'm going to do things. And does it have a, that's a laser pointer, not a turn off. Okay. So um, this is towards the end of this event. And so if I were to just come up here and talk to you about, uh, you know, the aging space or even the investment considerations in it, it would be, you know, a lot of repetition from other things that you've seen in other talks. So. I wanted to do something slightly different with my time today, um, and it's gonna be a little data heavy and a little bit different. So uh, we're gonna do three things that I call a perspective, a prospect, and an approach. And it'll cover, number one, some ways of talking about aging in this longevity biotech space that I think a lot of us aren't necessarily um, thinking about, or it's not like the first thing that I, I usually are the first things that I usually hear, hear people talk about. Then I want to kind of kick off from where, where Joe was just talking about and be the bad guy on, uh, on his uh, tables that he was showing us and talk about the situation in biotech VC, particularly biopharmaceutical VCs. Um, and then I want to go there to what my favorite strategy in this space is, both for biopharma VC and for the longevity biotech space, which is VC partnered venture building which is more than half of what I do. So I come, uh, that, that's my, my hammer that I'm uh, trying to strike everything with. Can we build a VC-backed venture build company around it? Okay, so to dive in, I just have about a dozen slides, which I think are interesting perspectives on the aging space. Um, I'm gonna talk here about demographic, economic, and human health problems. I'm not gonna touch on social solutions, because I think we're all here for the medical solutions. My first one is that it's important to remember that this is a new problem. This longevity issue that we're facing is quite a new thing to come to the forefront of people's minds because we are only now entering the fourth stage of what is called the demographic transition. As we go from a situation which is kind of the natural state of humans where we have very high birth rates and very high death rates, and we evolve through this population explosion that happens in stage two towards a more stable population distribution where birth rates and death rates are relatively low. We're just entering that stage. So this, this issue of having old people around in large numbers dying of diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's and having complications like type 2 diabetes and osteoporosis and arthritis is a relatively new situation. A hundred years ago, the three leading causes of death for humanity were influenza, tuberculosis, and pneumonia. And today, there are dementias, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. Um, so, I think this is kind of a, uh, the key thing in understanding the why now of this longevity space is that we are in the midst of this demographic transition. To illustrate this a bit more, here are some projections based on the uh, on UN numbers, these aren't, aren't mine, of my favorite statistic in looking at demography, which is the old age dependency ratio. This is the number of people 65 and older divided by the number of people younger than 65, or working age adults, 15 to 64. And what you can see, both in the developed world and the undeveloped world, um, these, these ratios are rising dramatically over this century. So we're expecting to go from you know, 1950, we're at about 12% uh, in the developed world, and we're gonna be almost 50% by the end of the century. That is a huge change. And the important thing to remember here is that as we get all of these older people in our society, our society is not set up to support these people. So we come up with this economic problem, which is that already in the middle of this graph, right, we're just right here, in the middle of this demographic shift, 
in the, demogra uh, in the developed world, we already have a crisis of underfunded pension obligations as we make commitments to people who can't work in old age because they're going to get sick. And so this right now, uh, according to Citibank, is about $78 trillion worldwide in under unfunded or underfunded pension liabilities. And I think that you can make a credible case that the only way of averting this number getting even bigger and causing even more social and economic calamity is by making people live longer, healthier, so that they can contribute more to society, even in our rounded demographic curve. Next, from a human health perspective, many of you guys have seen uh, variants of this graph, um, but I just wanted to do it with maybe more diseases, uh, showing the incredible association of aging with all of the leading causes of death, right? So this is a normalized occurrence rate. So every year you have a chance of getting a heart attack or getting, can getting cancer. And so if you plot the chances of getting cancer this year versus the highest chances that you will ever have in your life, what you'll see for all of these diseases is that the older you are, the higher your risk gets. Um, and, and that's true for cardiovascular, cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes, and kidney diseases. Moving right along, one of the things that we don't talk enough about in the aging space, um, but is critically important to understand why we think the technologies that the longevity biotech world is developing will be so powerful, is the issue of multimorbidity. And that is basically having more than one chronic condition at once that you have to deal with. So what you can see here is that as people get older, and I know this might be a little small for some of you in the back, um, but let's say as you move towards 75, by 75, about 41% of all people, 70, 70 to 75, or sorry, 75 to 79, 41% of all people have at least two Many of, more than half of those have more than two chronic conditions that they have to deal with. And then that number goes up and up and up as you get older. So people aren't just dealing with their you know, atherosclerosis, they're dealing with diabetes, they're dealing with COPD, they're dealing with senility all at the same time. And so for that reason, this great analysis that was done by uh, Dana Goldman and colleagues in 2013 showed that because there are all of these risks that come up together, if you just reduce risk and prevent one type of disease, let's say reducing cancer risk or reducing heart disease risk, you get almost no extension in healthy lifespan. Almost no. This is like 75 years is the base case. 76 years is what you get by just reducing the risk of one disease. You reduce aging risk, all the age-related diseases together by a smaller amount, and then that's only then can you see a huge jump in the number of healthy people, uh, in the, the average uh, age of healthy people, or average health span of people, let's put it that way. So for all this, uh, so this is just kind of like a little tour of some, some perspectives that I like um, when thinking about this space. And then the last one I'm gonna leave you with before we jump to the more kind of technical financy parts is, is this graph. Because these are the UN projections for average life expectancy in the United States um, over the next century. And when I went back far enough in the data, like these are really clear projections forward from about 1970. It's like almost a straight line of projections. But I think that what we are at the cusp of in the development of technology around longevity biotech is much less like this period from 1970 to 2020 where we were just starting to understand what the diseases of aging were actually caused by, what molecular characteristics they had, and how to approach them. I think that our new situation is going to be much more like the period from 1910 to 1950, when we were actually conquering many of the infectious diseases that were the leading causes of death at that time. We'd spent about, you know, whether you want to say 50, 100 years characterizing the germ theory of, uh, of disease and then developed new tools like vaccines and antibiotics and saw this massive upswing in average lifespan. And so my projection here 
um, is that as we conquer the diseases of aging, we're going to see a slope as, uh, as new drugs come out that will be more similar to when we were conquering infectious diseases than when we weren't making that much medical progress from the 70s to 2000. Okay, so now let's jump to the second part. I'm gonna show you six slides that are, um, and actually let me jump back before you spend too much time looking at, uh, looking at those numbers. I'm gonna show you six slides that will encapsulate what I think of as the biopharma VC space. Because um, like Joe was saying before, we're all in this universe of the startup ecosystem in biotech. And I think we may not, especially as this little niche industry um, that itself hasn't gotten many approved drugs um, yet, it's important to analyze what the industry that we're actually part of is, how it works, and what kind of success rates we should be expecting from this. So I want to start with just like an overview of what, biopharm, what the biopharma space is. These are companies that make drugs that go through clinical trials, and that's most of what we do in the longevity space. And there's a couple of interesting trends that have been happening in the biopharma space generally. The first is that the, the phase at which acquisitions are happening, so most companies will ultimately get acquired by a pharmaceutical company who will then do the latest stage trials and then sell the drug. And those acquisitions have been happening earlier and earlier. You can see in the white line here, these are preclinical and phase one stage companies. And um, it, since 2013, the numbers of commercial and phase three stage companies have been going down in the, the stage of acquisition. So companies are being acquired earlier, and even though they're being acquired earlier, they're being acquired for larger amounts with less time spent on those companies. As an investor, these three facts are really exciting, right? It means that you're making more money faster and you have to do less work to get there. Um, and so, on one hand, that means this is a great time to be investing in biotech. But on the second hand, it also makes investors worried. Um, second graph. Most new drugs today come from biotech startups. And this is a massive shift from what the world looked like 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you had the pharma companies. Pharma companies would either in-license stuff from academia, or they would do their own R&D, find drugs, and approve those drugs. In 2017, 75% of all of the approved drugs came from biotech startups. Many of them got acquired and were ultimately um, did the final trials from pharma, but that is also a hugely defining factor. That means that the vehicle of choice for getting an approved drug is a biopharma startup. Third, drugs that come from startups do better in the clinic than drugs from big pharma. So there is something that I find absolutely magical about the ability to take a very dedicated team, a founder and a, uh, a founding scientists, and throw them into a problem and say, all right, you guys need to get this thing to work and your company and everything that comes with it, many times reputation, many times uh, validation of the scientific theory, uh, all rides on getting this question right and answering this question in the right way. And that pays off in the long term because when drugs ultimately launch, it's almost twice as, twice as good for a drug to start in a biotech company and get in license to a pharma compared to internal development. All right, fourth. Total amounts of VC funding per round has been going up enormously in the last couple of years, particularly in 2017 and 2018. I have the medians and the means graphed here. Um, so this is average size per round, and you can see that in 2018, uh, Series A and B rounds on average for biotech companies were um, around $30 million. 30 million is a lot of money on, on a median. Seed rounds, however, are staying relatively small. Two, three million is the normal there. Fifth, IPO valuations have been going 
up and up and up for preclinical and phase one stage assets, but not for phase three. So before I get to my, my last piece that I, I want to close on for this little part of like an overview of, of where we are in the biotech investment space, um, you can draw two conclusions as you look at these five pieces of data. The first conclusion is, oh my god, this is absolutely the time to be doing a biotech startup um, in, in innovative drug development. The second conclusion is, crap, that looks a lot like a bubble. <laughs> and if you look at the macroeconomic situation from when a lot of my data starts, right, from 2011 until now, the stock market's been riding high. We've been in this expansionary economy. Um, and so a lot of investors that are thinking today about where I want to commit my money for a drug development program, right, they have to think, how is this market going to look three, four, five, ten years in the future? And there are some worrying signs for us that we have to be taking these, this risk of, of a bubble in biotech very, very seriously. One of the ones that I think is most apt is this graph. So if, if for those of you that don't know, 2018 was the biggest year of I, IPOs in biotech companies ever. There were over 60 IPOs. However, there was something a little bit disturbing that came along with these IPOs, which is that um, I'm graphing here. So these are each company uh, is a bar, and the the size of the bar indicates what percentage change their stock has had between their IPO in 2018 and the end of 2018, uh, December 31st. And you can see more than half of them declined, and a lot of them declined a lot in less than a year. What this means to me is that the public markets are really, really harsh on these early stage biotech companies. And Many companies, because there's an exuberance, there's an IPO window there, they're jumping into the public markets, and then without even having to show any more data, just now that they're uh, subject to public scrutiny of people who aren't there t trading on the potential of the company, but are instead trading on like what has the company done, they get hammered. And that makes private money and long-term investors to fund clinical development that much more important, potentially more important than it has ever been. Um, but it also means that investment going forward in the next five, six years is probably going to have to be more disciplined because I don't think that this IPO window with high valuations and freely available money, I don't think it's going to last. All right. So then that leads me to five quick conclusions about the biotech VC space. Number one, I want to avoid exuberance as much as possible. Number two, focusing on seed investments, getting in really early. I don't know, we didn't spend too much time on this, but round sizes aren't increasing there. Um, and getting in early and following things through, the timing and the amounts make a lot of sense. Um, number three, don't plan for the IPO ecosystem to continue the way it has been. Number four, only exit when you have a clear value story and you are confident that you can actually back away from, from the project. Don't just throw it out into the world and see how it goes. Um, and number five, I think this is the most important. Uh, there are some cautionary things here, but I think that overall, the trend that we've been seeing in the biotech ecosystem will continue. Um, and I didn't spend time on the data here, but the main reason that, that a lot of this boom has been so exaggerated is that pharma R&D is changing fundamentally, right? Resources are going away from the big pharma companies doing R&D into biotech startups. And that space that's being created in drug development, it isn't being filled fast enough. So even though there's a lot of resources going into it and there's a lot of excitement, Pharma companies still desperately need their pipelines to be filled and filled with good drugs. And so, so this space will continue to grow as this trend in moving to this more efficient way of creating, uh, creating drugs through biotech startup companies continues. Okay, 
Then my last piece that I want to do very quickly is just a little bit on my approach to how to play in this world um, and, and how I've uh, been working with scientists and entrepreneurs to do this. And this is with a venture-led company building process where I think that there are five key things that a company needs to do in order to pull together their story and become a real biotech company. Number one, you identify exceptional research. In our case, it's longevity research. Number two, you partner with the people who know the science intimately and never do a company without the scientists that know what the fuck they're talking about. Oh, sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. <laughs> say that. Hi, YouTube. Um, so work with the scientists that know the science because when you run into trouble, and you will always run into trouble when doing basic research, they are the only ones who have run into the same thing 10 times before and know the answer to what's going on. And it will slow down a company enormously if you don't have those guys on board. Uh, number three, biotech is a bit unique, and I, I think compared to the tech world, in how different the different phases of a company are as it progresses through its value chain. The guy who knows how to get uh, toxicology studies done and the guy who knows how to correctly f do a phase three clinical trial and the guy who knows how to successfully sell a drug on the marketplace are completely different from the guy who knows how to make a basic discovery in fruit flies. And so having a team that comes in at the appropriate time to be the leader of this team at the right time for that company is a characteristic of the best biotech companies that I know. And so um, one of the reasons that I want to focus on this, this VC led or this, uh, this company building model, and I think it works so well, is that you have people in the board of directors or who helped create the company that exist somehow behind the operational team. And the operational team can be led by a different person, whoever is needed the most for that phase of the company, but the overall mission and vision and science of the company can be supported by the founders all the way through, which is a model I really love. Uh, number four, you have to design your key value creating experiments, like what is the killer experiment, sine qua non, like without this, there is nothing, and do that experiment and fail fast uh, if you're, if you're going to fail. And then number five, biotech development is very expensive, right? You need to be able to have a path to 20 or $30 million rounds to do clinical trials. If you don't think that you'll be able to raise that money, you need to have a partner on board early on who you think can. Um, second thing, in thinking about building, I'm not going to spend time on this, but we do, we do things in three phases. Um, my favorite way of looking to build companies is in a hypothesis-led way. And whether you're an entrepreneur or you're a venture investor, this, I think, should be the start. Come up with a hypothesis and then explore, validate the hypothesis, get people on board, and then create it. And then my last slide is that it's easy to focus in on Silicon Valley and Boston as the two largest biotech hubs in the world. Um, and I think that doing so leaves so much on the table. Great basic research can be found everywhere in the world. And there are fantastic institutions um, in Europe, in Southeast Asia, in the center of the United States that are going underexplored. And so a big part of what I do at Kronos is look around to where the, that great research is done and then move forward wherever it is um, with, the, with a team that can actually accelerate it. So anyway, that's a bit of my perspective on the longevity biotech space. I thank you for your attention. Hopefully uh, with some useful information. And I will see you for the panel.